Um, today is interesting because Philip, my guest speaker, will be controlling the slide. So I have, I've, I don't have that much privilege anymore today, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. So let's dive in. Um, I want to start off, um, Philip, can you go to the next slide? Um, so I wanted to ask, what does travel mean to you before we really dive in to this? And I don't really know... Um, who uh, wrote this, but it sounds fascinating to me. So I wanted to read it out um, to all of you travel lovers who are joining our journey. So never lose your sense of wonder. No matter where you're at in life, it's important to never lose your sense of wonder. Stay curious about what's out there and don't be afraid to find out. The world is waiting to be seen by you. Go out and learn something new. And that's something that what I have been doing. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Leila Levy and I'm the founder um, and chief travel designer of my boutique travel concierge business. And what I am passionate about is building and um, dr uh, dream vacations and making it true for making that dream vacation true for a lot of people that they wanted to go somewhere, but it's just putting it all together. It's so um, hard. So I'm, I'm in a magician in one sense. Um, but for those of you who don't know me, my background is engineering and I spend years and years in technology and building analytical uh, platforms and data platforms. But this has been my passion and I've, I left my uh, past career to start something new and I am so um, in love with my passion and again I wanted to keep others inspired and um, after the COVID situation and we were not able to physically travel I started these virtual travel series which Every week on Thursdays, we go and explore one destination. So in terms of the, in terms of the content and to set expectation as to what um, you can expect in these uh, travel series, I typically bring on um, an, an expert um, for that region. Um, so I'm going to um, let Philip to introduce himself. And I have another surprise for you towards the end of the presentation, which is um, adding something that that's again, more relevant to this destination that we're going to explore. And um, without, and, and for those of you who, who are not following me on Instagram or Facebook, I highly, highly encourage you to do that because I'm, uh, I love sharing the knowledge and, and provide education and inspiration. And that's what I've been doing. So part of that virtual travel series, um, again, follow along. Um, so much interesting content are coming in. And without any further ado, I wanted to introduce Philip to you. So um, again, um, we are talking, we're going to explore Africa. And I can't tell you more about um, how valuable Philip has been to me, my business, and acting as my subject matter expert when it comes to traveling to Africa. Philip? Well, thank you very much. Thanks for that lovely introduction and, and good evening to all of you from around the world. How wonderful it is to be sharing this evening with you. And Leela, again, thanks for the opportunity uh, and inviting me to join you. I really enjoyed our previous uh, get together, which was down in the southern part of the African continent. We're moving up a bit northeast. Uh, we're going to be talking about that. Uh, just for your information, I've been in the tra travel industry for a very long time, for over a quarter century. Prior to that, I was a school teacher, believe it or not. And as you can tell from my accent, not originally from these parts. I was born and raised on the African continent in South Africa. I had the opportunity to travel and explore there quite extensively. I've lived in Canada for many, many years and have returned to Africa almost yearly, if not uh, twice yearly. Uh, and the company I work for, we specialize in long haul exotic destinations, which has always been my passion. And we create with specialists such as Leela, uh, exciting journeys to the world of exotic destinations. So th that's me. And some of you may have met me uh, on the previous occasion. Uh, but tonight, we are going to concentrate on safaris and East Africa. 
Okay, so um, again, going back to set expectations, what you're going to get tonight. So we're going to talk extensively about safari. When should I go on safari? All the things you need to know before you go and what happens on the safari and things like accommodation and different types of accommodation and um, driving, flying, um, all of the other things that you may have seen it um, as, you know, um, you know, people talking about it or showing their picture. So we're going to, we want to familiarize you with, familiarize you with the safari experience and also um, drill down into Kenya and Tanzania in terms of some of those safari experiences. So we typically have about a full hour or so presentation and then we have um, Q&A afterwards. So if you have Q&A uh, questions for us, leave it towards the end and we're gonna get there. So Philip, um, you're the expert on safari. So tell us all about safari experiences. I'm certainly going to do so. Thank you again. And, and you've really covered the introduction so well, uh, Lila, thank you very much. And I just also want to mention that when you speak about East Africa, of course, we can only touch on some of the highlights in those destinations, which we're going to cover, because otherwise we would be around for about uh, two hours. But let, let's go a little bit back and talk about safari, its meaning and where it orig originated from. Uh, so really, when you, you look up the word and you look up in any definition, whether it's a Collins Oxford Dictionary or online, the one thing you're always going to notice about the word safari is that they make reference to a certain number of words, such as to observe, to go on an expedition, to go on a journey. All the definitions say it is to go and view animals, and most of them also refer to hunting, because hunting really was what safaris were all about in the early 1800s into the 1900s. But what is significant about the definition is that for the most part, they all highlight East Africa as the place to go for a safari experience. And that is why we're talking about it uh, tonight. So really we want to go and observe animals in their natural habitat. So what we do know from these definitions is that mid 1800s to the 1900s, the whole idea about a safari was to go out and hunt and come back with the trophy so you could show off and, and show people what you, your kill. And of course, that's not something we do. And of course that has now diminished quite considerably. We more interested in getting to view the animals, as you see on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, in their natural habitat. The interesting thing, uh, where did the word safari actually come from? There was this great uh, explorer by the name of Richard Burton, and by the way, it's got nothing to do with uh, Richard Burton, who married Elizabeth Taylor a number of times, I believe. Uh, he was an explorer. He was actually a very intelligent man. You can do some interesting reading about him. He could speak numerous languages. And when he was down in Africa, came into contact with the African language and also Arabic. And the Arabic word safaria means a voyage, an expedition. And that is where the word safari really originated from. And it is to go on a voyage to view animals in their natural habitat. As Leila has mentioned to you, East Africa, Kenya and Tanzania, I just want to put it into perspective in terms of where it is located on the continent of Africa. And really when we hone in a little bit more, we're going to be concentrating really on this region over here. Uh, and we're going to do a little journey, but we're going to do that in a little while. So let's start off by looking at what is it that you need to know prior to travel to Kenya and Tanzania? So uh, many of our clients, and Leela's got this experience too, ask a lot of questions about certain items about getting to uh, Kenya and Tanzania, things that they want to know about luggage and, and, and health and so on. So I know that we have many of you attending from around the world. I'm located in Toronto. So one of the ways of getting from Canada down to East Africa, many airlines operate. I use KLM as an example, reason being that out of the United States and out of Canada, 
They have many hubs from where they fly into Amsterdam, and then really it is an easy hop down into Kenya or Tanzania. The significant thing is that if you're going to be covering both destinations, you can do an open jaw where you can fly into Kenya and out of uh, Tanzania. So this is just one example. Of course, there are myriad of other airlines when they start operating again. So across the pond, really, it's anything from six to eight hours to get into Amsterdam, and then an eight to nine hour journey down into East Africa. So that's the easy way of getting there. Now, in terms of visa requirements, and ladies and gentlemen, please note, being in Canada, I am now, this specifically is applicable to Canadians who are attending this, uh, this evening. Uh, Canadians do need a visa to enter both Kenya and Tanzania. There is a cost involved, 30 to $51. The Kenyans require you to have two blank pages side by side, and the most common principle with all passports they must be valid for six months after your return. One of the other questions we get asked quite frequently, Nila, and I know you get asked this a, a, a lot, is the best time to travel. So really, most tour operators will tell you, even in East Africa, that Kenya, Tanzania are year-round destinations. But what you can look out for is when it is the rainy season, which really falls both destinations, April, May into early June, which is called the long rainy season. And then they have a shorter rainy season, which is about November, maybe into early December. So January to March, uh, October to December, great times uh, to travel. And also July and August, which is the peak high season of travel. That little graph that you see there is indicating some game parks in Kenya. And you can also see by the color coding what the conditions are like at certain times of the year, January, February, March, running across the top. And if you look, for the most part, it is excellent and good. The only time you're looking at fair is really during that rainy season. Uh, so think of it as a year-round destination. Uh, and uh, the popular times really July, August, October to December. In terms of health requirements, uh, you need to contact your doctor six to eight weeks at least prior to departure to determine if any inoculations are required. We cannot give that up. A uh, um, medical person needs to do that. But what we can tell you is that you will need some form of malaria protection. And in doing so, you need to consult a health clinic uh, or your doctor. So when it comes to packing for your East Africa, and for those of you who have watched our South Africa um, virtual tour, you know more about um, South Africa and how we differentiated, how is the difference between uh, uh, South um, Africa safari versus East Africa. But we also um, use um, when we can to talk about those different uh, differentiation points for you to, to know exactly um, what those differences are. And one of those big ones is in terms of packing. And when you're going to East Africa, you are typically going on a four by four safari um, drive uh, from different those game drives that we showed briefly on the map. And we are going to talk about some of those. So there is a lot of, you know, traveling on those four by four vehicles from one place to another one, or you'll be going on those um, sky um, safari experiences, which again, you'll be flying. And so because of this whole experience, um, the, the, the limitation for baggages, it's about 15 kilos or 33 pounds. Um, and uh, the other, and, and again, the, the bag needs to be soft baggage because again, as you can imagine, there are about six people on a vehicle and that was pre-COVID. So we don't know how that thing would look like after COVID or how many people would be on right. the same vehicle. Right. But um, again, that's sort of, and if you're going on a plane, we're talking about nine seater plane. So 
So it's really those baggages are important. The second important point is plastic bags, such as your Ziploc, your grocery bags, and all the other stuff, which we tend to put a lot of our stuff in there is prohibited in, in Kenya. So you need to create, take with you some other sacks, which I, um, I have some pictures of that on the left to take with you. When it comes to um, packing, um, this is this is not really um, you know a fashion thing that uh, that you think that that's why uh, people are looking like that um, because again um, you wanted to not jump out at animals because some of those white sharp colors would be um, distracting animals or um, so it's it's one of those things that you wanted to try to wear khakis as much as possible as well as don't forget a warm layer because when you're going on your uh, game drive in the morning, most probably you need some sort of, um, you know, some sort of layer to wear. So khakis, olive colors, brown clothing, that's sort of the colors that you should take with you. Uh, so take, d don't take too much on the fashion stuff for your safari trip, especially to East Africa. Yeah. Uh, good point. Uh, about the clothing there. And just to, to, to reinforce what you said, uh, as you can see by that vehicle in the visual there, uh, you can see there's not much space for luggage, hence that soft bag that is really required. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the safari experience itself and what we mean by the safari experience. One of the questions we ask very often is, you know, can't I just go to one lodge and spend two weeks there and the answer to that is, well, you certainly can, but it will become very tedious after a while. Uh, but we do move you from one lodge to the other because they are located in different regions. And there's very specific reasons why we move around from one area to the other. And I'm going to be touching on that in more detail as we work through the presentation. Typically, the safari experience consists of early and morning afternoon game drives. And sometimes when you are on a driving safari, that game drive is done en route to the lodge. So some itineraries, ladies and gentlemen, that you're going to see out there are going to be a driving safari. Some may be a flying safari. Leela's made reference to that already. And some of them actually offer a driving safari with a flight towards the end of the actual flying uh, safari itself, the end of the safari itself. Uh, and we're going to be looking at, at those options. Vehicles that we use, all four by four vehicles, you notice there that I say no air conditioning. Uh, they've tried to put them in because the roads are bumpy and dusty. It just creates problems to keep the, the systems going. They are working on that, some do. Everybody gets window seating. Six people per vehicle. And you made a very interesting comment, Nina, when you spoke about post-COVID, how that's going to work. And I can actually tell you that many of our suppliers are already looking at options of perhaps reducing that number from, from six to four or whatever the case may be. So window seating for everybody. There's a pop-up roof. You look out and that's how you will get to view the animals. And you are, are accompanied by an English speaking driver guide. What's important here is that if you are on a driving safari from beginning to end, that person's going to accompany you and take you through Kenya. And then in Tanzania, you'll meet up with a new driver guide and they'll take care of you there. If you're doing a flying safari, you will fly to the lodge and the local resident ranger will take care of you at that end. Once you start your safari, it's a full board. So all meals are included, breakfast, lunch, and dinner from beginning to end. So we, the question right at the beginning when I said the safari experience, what is it all about? Why do we have to travel so often? Or every second day or every third day? One of the reasons is that you will get to see different animals in different regions. And for example, here we have the Grevy zebra, uh, the Grevy zebra, which you will normally find in the northern part of Kenya in the Samburu area. And as you move further south, this is the type of zebra you will find down in the areas of the Masai Mara. So you can actually see the difference there. And there's certainly uh, more differences of animals, which we're also going to talk about again a little later. 
And the other reason why you move often is because the, the terrain changes. So you have these wide, beautiful, open plains of the Serengeti and the Maasai Mara with larger herds of animals, while up in the northern parts of Kenya, it's more dry, arid, and different types of animals to be found there. Now, in the itineraries that you will see out there, you will see some that are lodge only, tent only, or a combination of both lodge and tented accommodation. So very often, people who have not traveled to Africa before and they hear about tented accommodation, they maybe freak out a little bit and say, hang on a minute, I do not want to go and stay in some little tent in the bush. This is not for me. When we talk about luxury tented accommodation, think of a four or five star hotel room. Remove the walls, remove the roof, and put a canvas over it. And that's really what we mean when we talk about a luxury uh, a safari experience with tented accommodation. Uh, here, here's an example for you, Serengeti uh, uh, Migration Camp, beautiful luxury tented lodge. As you can see, the accommodations are terrific, it's big. All tented accommodations come with ensuite facilities. So you don't have to worry about having to go outside. That's not how it works with tented accommodations. Some of them have different forms. So the one that I've shown you earlier is pure canvas, while others come with a thatched roof. For example, Sweetwater's tented camp, which is located in, in uh, Kenya, also but raised off the ground. And again, this is probably more in your four-star category, if you had to give it a star rating, um, and beautiful ensuite facilities offered throughout. On the other side, you have what is commonly called lodge accommodation. These are more solid structures, hotel-like maybe. Um, example, Four Seasons Serengeti. So this is a typical high-end lodge that you will find in the Serengeti. If you had to begin, they don't give star ratings, but certainly in the five-star rating. And on the four-star rating side, you'll probably find, uh, and we use them very often, is a group called Serena Lodges. This is the Serena Lodge at the Ngorongoro Crater. They really provide consistently good four-star accommodation throughout both Kenya and Tanzania. So, so there you have the difference between uh, tented and lodge accommodation. So I added this slide because one of the things that's so special for me when it comes to Africa is that the peacefulness and the quietness of this whole land. And one of the things I wanted to briefly talk to you about was the fact that you can sleep under the stars. And if you're not as adventurous to literally sleep in um, in, in a lower ground um, space, there are some other actually very interesting places that would provide that opportunity for you so that you could literally sleep under the stars. And um, imagine it's, uh, it's dark, you could see all the stars and you could see animals roaring from far away. And that's on the left. That's somewhere that you could possibly shower. So I wanted to bring this to your, um, to your attention that, you know, the sky is the limit when you're traveling to, um, to Africa. That's right, putting it. So um, going back to getting um, around, for those of you, again, I'm going to reference on our experience in South Africa because it is, it is vastly different than what you're going to experience in, in East Africa. In South Africa, we talked about the national um, parks versus the game drives and how the vehicles are different. As you can see in the pictures, the, the vehicles are um, closed vehicles with pop-up um, 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 space. Um, so it's it's very different than what you would typically see and experience in um, South Africa. The roads are bumpy. Um, again, the infrastructure is not as solid as um, South Africa. And the travel times are uh, quite long. So between three to almost six hours time between the these lodges. And sometimes you start from one lodge, you do your game drive, and you're going to stay um, at night in 
in another lo uh, in another lodge or tent um, or whatever it is. So it's sort of like how you'll be going around. Um, so just setting expectation that um, safari in East Africa is very different than what you would typically see in South Africa. Great, so Philip will be talking now about a little bit of um, flying over different um, spots that uh, we'll be visiting as part of the safari experience. Okay, so as Leela said, one of the options and one of the itineraries you will see is, is, is completely driving and that's the kind of vehicle that we use. Um, the other alternative is that some itineraries or if you customize itineraries can include flights. Now, within Kenya, they have scheduled flights that you can take into some of the game uh, national parks. Uh, so that's one way of traveling. The advantage of that, of course, is it does cut down on travel time. Data, so it gives you uh, uh, a little bit more time at the lodge. You can go and kind of chill out at the swimming pool. Uh, it is very scenic, because sometimes when you come in low, you can actually see the animals, which is really terrific. It may be the more expensive option, uh, but sometimes that's not an issue. Uh, interestingly enough, there are some uh, companies uh, such as Sky Safari that have their own properties and aircraft and they actually take you from one lodge to the next, but that is making use of their own properties uh, uh, in Kenya and Tanzania. They actually have a seven night in both, a seven night safari in Kenya, seven night in, in, in Tanzania. Uh, and you fly in this beautiful nine-seater uh, uh, Cessna and they take you around and this is set departures that they have using their accommodation. So this is another alternative uh, that is offered uh, out there. You can see this is a great way of traveling. Um, and again, this is a very specific mode of travel, set departures with a specific uh, branded company out there. So now I'm going to walk you through how does a typical safari day look like? Um, again, there is a, there is a different difference between the South Africa and the East Africa, but in East Africa, you would typically uh, wake up, have your breakfast um, at the lodge, either inside or outside of the lodge, a little bit as a picnic space. And then, um, Philip, can we go to the next slide? Oh, sorry, yeah. Oh. And then you go on your game drive uh, right after breakfast um, and you see all the animals. Um, you may have some sort of coffee break and then you head back to your lodge for, for your lunch. And, um, you know, the food in these lodges or again, tented um, uh, places are very good. So don't worry about all of that. And uh, they take care of all the dietary restrictions. Yes. And after you are done with your lunch, um, you have some sort of relaxation or some sort of activities after the lunch. So you could go, you know, horseback riding, you could go and explore um, some, um, some part of that region that you are with an expert. You could go um, mountain biking. So there are tons of other activities that you could do um, or, um, and then, um, or even like uh, taking, getting a massage, uh, there are pools typically at those accommodations, um, getting a tea, and then again, preparing for your second round of going on a game drive. So um, again, you do your second round of game drive uh, most of the time. Uh, so typically two or three game drives a day. And then, um, can we go to the next yeah. slide, Philip? Yes. And then um, it's almost the dinner time. Um, mm -hmm. You could have dinner uh, all the, uh, um, as it outdoor or indoor. Um, the one that the picture on the right, left corner, it's, uh, it's called Boma, which is those like traditional outside um, uh, dinner that they, uh, they create. And then after that, it's again, one of my favorite times of the day, which is sitting and chilling and socializing with your friends or, um, you know, your partner and talking about what impressed you most yeah. as part of your game drive and just reflecting on the day. 
So taking you back to, you know, we talked about Safari, we talked, um, we, we um, talked a little bit of all those important things that you needed to know in order to move forward with actually now and going and exploring this um, place. So can we go to the next slide? So now we are going to go a little bit into um, one, uh, we have one example itinerary that we're going to uh, walk you through. And then right after this, I have some polls because I wanted to um, assess your knowledge of Kenya. Mm -hmm. Philip, do you want to talk about that briefly before? Yeah. Um, sure. So, so what we are doing here, what I'm really wanting to highlight are some of the key national parks, game reserves that uh, you would typically see, particularly for the first time traveler to East Africa in itinerary. So we're talking about uh, Amboseli, Samburu, Lake Nakuru, Masai Mara, the Serengeti, and that wonderful Ngorongoro crater. And uh, it's just to give you a sense of what it is when you read about it in an itinerary. And this is the kind of journey that could take between 12 to 14 days uh, to do. All right, so let's do, um, I'm going to launch um, a poll on Kenya because I want to know how well you know Kenya. So we're going to take um, 30 seconds or so because we have a lot of content and we haven't really gone to Kenya or Tanzania yet. So the questions are, What's the official language of Kenya? Is hunting illegal in Kenya? And the third question is, what's the fastest land animal that's famous in Kenya? Huh. Okay. I ended the poll. Um, so the official language of Kenya is Swahili. Um, um, hunting in Kenya is illegal. And in fact, uh, again, for those of you who, who, who were with us in our South Africa, uh, all those, and uh, Philip, correct me if I'm wrong, but all those parks in um, Kenya are national parks. So uh, there is no sort of like private land for, for viewing animals um, in, in Kenya. There's some uh, some concessions in, uh, in certain areas, but that's a that's a whole different story, a concept that we can talk about another time. And then cheetah is the fastest land animal, which I guess most of you all um, answer that question. Excellent, excellent. All right, so moving into um, why Kenya should be um, on your bucket list. So one of the things that stands out for me is um, again. Um, Kenya and East Africa is one of the places that um, you probably have heard Masai Mara National Park and it's um, famous for the uh, abundance wildlife and annual um, great migration which we are going to talk about that and it's so it's a fantastic place for a safari and um, so um, I, I, I'm probably repeating myself, but if you're looking for a true safari experience, um, East Africa would provide that opportunity. So it's sort of like Safari 2.0 or 3.0, if you <laughs> wanted to call it. And then um, we're also going to talk to you a little bit about the beaches and some other beauty and natural beauty that uh, you can explore in, um, again, Kenya or Tanzania. Um, one of the things that's so important for me um, for Nairobi, which is the capital of uh, Kenya is, um, and I have actually one slide for it, which is um, Nairobi is the only city in the world that has a national park on its doorstep, which to, for me is like so, so cool thing. Um, so let's just, uh, let's just dive in. And it has lots of cultural things that we're going to talk about. So moving um, to next slide, um, Nairobi, yes or no? Absolutely, yes. And we're going to tell you why absolutely yes, because there are some um, fantastic experiences um, that we're going to talk about. So again, this is a picture of Nairobi National Park. And you can see um, not, not the five of all the big 
five animals in Africa, but you see a lot of those. And you could see in the background that mm -hmm. there are there is a uh, there there is actually city in the background, which is so so unique uh, for me. But again, moving forward, and Philip will tell us more about why Nairobi uh, should be one of your stops along the way if you're going to Kenya and yeah. Tanzania. Indeed, and, and you've already mentioned about the National Park, so it's already your first introduction if you opt to do that as an uh, optional uh, to get to view some animals. But so often itineraries are inclined to get people into Nairobi and then leave the next day on safari. And really, there are quite a lot of interesting things that can be done and to be seen. One is the David Sheldrick Wildlife Fund. Uh, this was established about 40 years ago, and as you can see, they're particularly well known for its elephant, elef I'll try that again, its elephant orphan program of rescue and rehabilitation. So really, they go out and rescue young elephants uh, where the mother, the matriarch, has de deceased, uh, poaching maybe by natural death, and they are not able to survive on their own, and they brought here and rehabilitated. You can actually see this visual here of the handlers who look after specific uh, elephants. You can visit this. It is not uh, uh, one of those interaction programs where you get to ride an elephant. We don't do that. This is purely to see and understand uh, the mission of the, and the great work that they do. Um, and it's a, you can also adopt one of those elephants, and it really is a great introduction to, uh, to, to East Africa and the wonderful work that they do. Some of you may be familiar with uh, the Karen Blixen, uh, Isaac Dennison. She uh, was a Danish writer. Uh, she established herself in uh, Nairobi on this magnificent plantation. She lived there from about 1917 to 1931. Uh, husband passed away, and then she fell in love with a gentleman by the name of Dennis Finch Hatton. Uh, he died in a plane crash in 1931. She left the plantation, she left Kenya, and went and uh, back, back to Denmark. So if you haven't seen the movie Out of Africa, uh, do take a look. I believe it's with Robert Redford and Meryl Street. A very interesting and tells this wonderful love story. And now, of course, it is a museum that you can visit. The other really interesting place to visit is Giraffe Center. So uh, Giraffe Center was started in the 1970s where a young couple determined and established that a certain species of giraffe known as the Rothschild giraffe, their numbers were dwindling. And so they decided to create a breeding center so that they could increase the number and then get them back into the bush and they've really been very successful in doing that because they were down to about 130 and now over 300 plus uh, Rothschild giraffe that have been successfully relocated into some of the parks. Uh, this is uh, an opportunity to actually go to the center and meet up with the giraffe. On the property itself is a hotel. The hotel is called Giraffe Manor. That is a beautiful luxury property. Uh, you can actually see the giraffe there, the giraffe uh, wandering around. Uh, it is one of those properties, Leela, where you have to really book way in advance because yes. everybody wants the opportunity to go and stay there. So they really sell out uh, pretty quickly. It's a great experience. You really come into contact with these gentle giants, as they are called having your breakfast, peering over your shoulder. It's a great, uh, and, and of course, if you're taking young children on a safari experience, it, it really is a, a, a wonderful experience for them. So that's one hotel uh, in, in Nairobi where, where you can stay. Um, and what we're going to be doing in, during the course of the itinerary is give you examples of accommodations in the different places. The other is a lovely four-star property called the Boma Hotel. Uh, located in Nairobi, offers really excellent accommodation and we use that very often. So moving out of Nairobi, I mentioned to you I'm going to highlight some of the key reserves that you would normally find, particularly for the first time traveler. One of my favorites is Amboseli, located down in the southern part, as you can see, almost on the border with uh, Tanzania. One of the reasons I really like this 
is it is on the border and in the background you have the majestic Mount Kilimanjaro. Kilimanjaro is located in Tanzania. Amboseli is located in Kenya, particularly well known for its large herd of elephants. So elephants, and this is where uh, you would go to really experience that. You can drive in, you can fly in, and over and above uh, the elephants, a variety of other species of animals to be found, maybe not large herds, and typically morning and afternoon game drive is what you will experience here. Because of the mountain, the snow, and the rains, of course, it creates quite a marshy area. You can actually see the uh, elephants having a field time in, in the marsh. I actually got to see that when I was there. Now, when you look at this visual, the first thing you're probably going to say, but hang on a minute, that vehicle is different to what you showed us earlier. And there's a reason for that. You remember I said that if you do a flying safari and you go and stay at specific lodges, you can then use the vehicle of that particular lodge. And, and that is the case over here because you are using their vehicle in their specific uh, area of the park itself. So it's home to a variety of animals. You'll get to see rhino, hopefully some cheetah, a zebra, and uh, many other animals. Beautiful accommodation. Uh, our luxury property there is Tortillas Camp. It is a luxury tented camp. It is the lovely thing about that is that you wake up in the morning and you open the tent, you look out, and this is what you see uh, a bit of open plain and majestic Mount Kilimanjaro located in Tanzania across the way. On the four star side of things, Amboseli Serena Lodge providing very comfortable uh, luxury four star accommodation. We head up north, and again, I'm not uh, doing this in a particular order, but heading up north to Samburu. Again, itineraries may either drive you from Nairobi or fly you up there, depending on what you select. And this is the entrance to Samburu, and the visual that you see there of the design actually shows a specific species of giraffe that you do find in Samburu. It's called the reticulated giraffe. Uh, again, different species, and that's why we travel from region to region. Look at the terrain. Very different to what you see in Amboseli. It is semi-desert. It's arid, semi-dry, more bushier, uh, and you find different species of animals, such as the oryx, uh, which you won't necessarily find further down south. The Geranook. It's that long-necked uh, antelope, they stand on their hind quarters and of course forage up on the nice fresh leaves up at the top of the, uh, of the trees and a variety of other animals. So there you can see the reticulated giraffe, this is in Samburu, the grevy zebra, we spoke about that earlier in the presentation, uh, relevant to this region and not necessarily down in the south. Again, morning and afternoon game drive and you will get to see other animals as well. Accommodations in Samburu, one example would be the elephant bedroom camp. I really like uh, elephant bedroom camps. It's a typical tented. You really feel uh, uh, that you have that African experience uh, uh, of way back here. Um, it is tented. It's lovely to hear the sound. It's luxury, as you can see, as its own little plunge pool uh, and really provides excellent accommodation. Most itineraries that you're going to see out there will probably include one of the lakes, either Lake Naivasha, Lake Nakuru. I've included Lake Nakuru as an example. So if you're driving down from Samburu down to Lake Nakuru, it'll probably take you about five and a half hours to get there. We stop along the way, we see the beautiful Thompson's Falls, and then we spend a night or two at Lake Nakuru, uh, situated at about five and a half thousand feet above sea level, and well known for its flamingos. Beautiful sight, and more often than not, when I've been there, you don't only get to see flamingos down at the, at the lakeside, but also other animals such as zebra and rhino I've seen down there. And of course, there are different types of, uh, uh, if you are a birder, different types of flamingos. There's the greater one, the lesser one, and you can distinguish them by the beaks. Uh, one is red and the other is uh, light pink. 
but I'm not going to go into those details. You can experience that when you are at Lake Nakuru. Of course, if you are a birder and you're really interested in birding, a, a great place to visit, and also Lake Naivasha, where you'll get to see a variety of birds, great white pelicans, the blue-eared starling, just to mention a few. You will arrive at Lake Nakuru, you'll have an afternoon game drive, and hopefully get to see a variety of animals. And if it's a one-night stay, you will leave the next morning to head down south. So remember we spoke about the Rothschild uh, giraffe earlier, about the uh, breeding. So this is one of the places where you'll probably get to see uh, where they have been re relocated. And some other interesting uh, primates along the way as well. Accommodation, uh, lovely, Mbweha Camp. This is a solid structure providing uh, beautiful luxury accommodations as you can see here. Lovely open spaces, African feel, time to spend at the pool. And we move on. So from Lake Nakuru, we're going to head down to the Masai Mara and the Serengeti. So I'm going to combine in the Masai Mara and the Serengeti. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, the Serengeti really extends into Kenya and becomes the Masai Mara. So people who may only want to do the Kenya itinerary would go to Masai Mara. Those who want to do the combo of Kenya and Tanzania, we actually spend like two nights in the Masai Mara and two nights uh, in the Serengeti. Some interesting facts for you about the Serengeti and the Masai Mara. You can actually see the size difference. 14,500 square kilometers of the Serengeti versus 1,500 square of the uh, Masai Mara. They offer between 95 and 100 plus species of mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and for again, for the birders, 400 to 500 species. Have a look at that visual. We spoke about traveling and different terrain, wide open plains that you will see both in the Masai Mara and uh, the Serengeti. Usually when you have wide open plains, larger herds of uh, animals to be seen, wildebeest, zebra, and typically, during the time of the migration. So this is probably a question that's on your mind. When does this migration take place? And many of you have probably seen on television programs, the BBC, National Geographic, whatever it may be, this mass crossing of hundreds of thousands of wildebeest and zebra crossing over the Maasai River. So that happens in September. So if you do top left, top right, you can see September, that is where the migration will be, crossing over the Mara River. But this is not something that just happens then. This is a year-long event. So if we follow those white arrows, you can actually see the movement throughout the month of how this migration actually takes place through Tanzania and through Kenya through the Maasai Mara, and then the circle starts again. So for those of you who don't know, they get to the Maasai Mara, and it, all it takes is for one wildebeest to decide, now's the time to leap in, because lying and waiting for them are all the crocodiles, because I mean, let's face it, this is their yearly buffet, almost to say, it, that's coming by. And it's quite dramatic uh, uh, when, when you witness something like this. But for your information, this is round trip that they do that really takes about a year to complete, it's over a thousand kilometers, anything between a million, five to two million wildebeest, 200,000 zebra, 250,000 wildebeest actually die in the process, as do 30,000 zebra. And January to March, 8,000 wildebeest are born each day. And this process happens every year and it's quite spectacular to see. So, as I said, all it takes is for one to leap in, the rest follow. The zebra come in a little bit later. Uh, they're quite smart, actually. They send the zebra in first, to, to, and then they follow up. So when you have uh, large herds of, of animals such as that, 
you often find that there are many, many cats. Uh, uh, cheetah, you mentioned those earlier. Cheetah, leopard, lion, plentiful in the Masai Mara and in the Serengeti. Maybe you'll even get to witness a takedown. Um, that is quite natural and common to see. And of course, they are plentiful in number. Over and above that, other animals to be seen, antelope such as the toppy. You'll also get to see, hopefully, the hyena, not my favorite, the jackal. And I'm just giving you a couple of examples. And the ever energetic hippo, as you can see. And again, for those of you who are birders, there are a vast variety of birds to be seen. And your game ranges are really, really good at identifying the birding. So uh, that will be good for you. And then ending your stay in the Serengeti or Masai Mara, nothing to beat an African sunset, which you can see here. Um, uh, those wide open plains and the open skies that really create something quite sensational. Accommodation, just a couple of examples for you. In the Masai Mara, there's the Sanctuary Oranana Lodge, which is a luxury property. As you can see, beautiful open spaces. Typically, again, your outings there will be morning and afternoon game drives. Chipilakwani camp. So you remember I mentioned uh, elephant bedroom at the beginning. This is a sister camp. Uh, and I really like using their properties, as I say, because it really gives you that feel about Africa and hearing the sounds of the animals when you're out in a tented lodge. Uh, and as you can see, on suite facilities. Now, in this uh, Masamara and the Serengeti, there are a couple of other things that can be done. If you are uh, celebrating a specific birthday or an anniversary, you can arrange a nice outing for you. You can do breakfast out in the bush, maybe a sundowner uh, uh, at the lodge. So we can really organize something specific and entertaining for you. What a lot of folks do when they do go to uh, Masai or Serengeti is a balloon safari. What's important, Leila, about the balloon safari is that this takes the place of that one morning game drive. So it's early up in the morning, four o'clock, uh, weather dependent, of course, wind dependent, uh, and off you go, where you are then taken on this wonderful experience. Uh, it lasts for about 45 minutes to an hour, the actual uh, balloon ride itself. And I just want to do a shout out to our photographer who, who gave me permission to, um, to use his uh, slides. So thank you, James, for that. Um, and off you go. And of course, great viewing for those of you who enjoy seeing the animals from above. I have a bit of a height issue, so that's sometimes a bit of a problem for me. You know, so I don't do the balloon safari that often. And you end it with a fabulous champagne breakfast. And that would be your morning game drive for that particular day. One other activity would also include going to visit a, a local village. And I know, Leela, you're going to be touching on that uh, in a little while as well. Yeah, so, move, so move. these, can we, can we go back for a second? And I know that we are running out of time, so I'll just cut it short. But um, apart from, and that's, I think, one of the other things I love about Kenya and Africa is you could, you could do a lot of safari and a lot of animal experiences, but there is some sort of culture. And these are a nomadic uh, local people called uh, Maasai. And the, part of the reason they are close to Maasai Mara um, area and they've got um, interesting traditions. So one of the things that I always recommend people to do is to spend half day um, exploring some of the Maasai villages. And they've got um, interesting, weird uh, traditions, which we don't really have too much time to to uh, talk on, uh, talk about those. But um, I'll tell you a few of those. So these people are herders. So they, um, and uh, their wealth is uh, considered by the, how many, uh, the number of kids they have or the number of kettle um, that they own. Um, also, um, there is a tradition um, sort of like dance that men do in this part of uh, the world that they they do sort of like leaping up and uh, creating, yeah, like you can see in the picture that it's, uh, it's an interesting type of dance. Okay. 
So, yes, I've got to move on as we gain from the Serengeti. We're going to go across to the beautiful Ngorongoro crater. You'll also find this in an itinerary. So the crater itself was a volcano that instead of exploding, it imploded and created these massive walls. This happened about two and a half million years ago. They estimate about 30,000 animals in the crater itself. It's about 18 kilometers wide and was declared a World Heritage Site. So usually you would arrive at the crater, spend a night and the next day go in and do game viewing in the crater itself. Uh, don't expect to see massive herds of animals, but you will certainly see a variety of animals in different habitats. What is so interesting, wide open plains, there's some forest areas, there are some uh, uh, lake areas. So you will find any a variety of animals and also a variety of bird species within the crater itself. It's really uh, an interesting journey to go down and, and spend the day there and to actually see these massive walls that were created millions of years ago and the fact that the animals have actually uh, settled and, and lived within those walls. So a variety of animals to be seen. Accommodation, the beautiful manor, which is about 45 minutes drive from uh, the crater itself, very traditional style of accommodation. And I thought I'd throw this one in because it's so unique. It's right on the rim of the crater, the Ngorongoro Crater Lodge, and I would probably say a little bit over the top, but really offers- It has an outstanding view. It does, it certainly does. And look at that accommodation. And, and then, of course, we also have the Serena Lodge, which we spoke about a little earlier, also on the Crater Lodge, offering very comfortable accommodation. We then go to Arusha, where the safari ends. Safari could start there and go in the opposite direction, uh, again, depending on the itinerary and what you select. There are some accommodations here, the beautiful Mount Meru Hotel, which would probably be a four-star property. Uh, if you fly into Arusha to start your safari, this is where you would probably stay, or the beautiful Arusha Coffee Lodge. Uh, and I would encourage you to include that for a night or two, because it is actually a working coffee plantation. You can go do a tour of the plantation uh, when you are staying there. So that's quite terrific. Again, beautiful luxury accommodation. So the question now is, yeah, we've done this wonderful two-week safari. Is this the end, Leela? Well, no, it is not. We actually have two things. So one is I want to um, leave um, our presentation with some magical place of Zanzibar and an island off the coast of uh, Tanzania. Yeah and the amazing, beautiful sceneries. And then second thing that we wanted to get into, um, and um, we briefly talked about the quality of the pictures, some were mine and Philip's and some were some professionals, but we also have um, a special guest tonight that she's going to talk to us about how to take the best pictures with our own cell phones and share some of the tips that we'll be needing for all of our trips. So we're going to wrap up the, the Zanzibar and some of those beautiful accommodations um, that it exists. So one of the things that I I'll always, again, recommend is to go for the safari and all of that experiences, but maybe give two days or so just for a relaxing Zanzibar, right. yeah. um, just relaxing uh, time. Uh, and it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, place. And, and here, just a couple of examples. I mean, there are a ton of accommodations we know, but uh, yes, Kilindi, it's, uh, what I like about this property, what you see there, those are actually the accommodations, uh, these uh, palladiums that they have, really a luxury property, beautiful beach. Um, it has its own little plunge pool and really great to go and, and chill out for two or three nights. You could do paddle boating, kayaking, snorkeling can be arranged. Another example is Beraza Resort and Spa, which we use. It's a much larger property, accommodates more people. Again, it has one of the top rated beaches on the island, provides excellent accommodations and a variety of water activities uh, that can either be included or at an additional cost. And really a nice massage after all those times out 
on safari. And then, of course, the safari comes to an end and it's time to go home. I'm just going to wrap up, Zila, just by talking about very briefly, I know our time is almost up, but I know people always ask us this question and say, well, we send people to these countries, maybe third world developing countries. What are our suppliers doing down there in terms of the local community? And what are we doing to work on occasions as a company? Very quickly, uh, just an example of one of the uh, uh, companies that we work with, Elowana, all many, many of their camps have state-of-the-art power systems, and this is to ensure you know, that minimum emissions and fuel use. They have very, very strict recycling systems. They try and employ 50 to 75 percent of staff from the local community. They have training programs on how to grow foods so that they can purchase the food from them and then bring it to the table uh, of the guests, and that way they get the community involved. In terms of our company, Tour Convocations, we have our own project. It is called Enriching Lives International, where we are involved in give back projects in a variety of destinations. In Kenya, we are involved with an orphanage. In Tanzania, with a primary school. $10 of every booking gets put into account, and we use that to assist them with whatever they need from medical supplies to school books and so on. And that is our way of giving back to the communities uh, where we are sending people. So that is East Africa and all about safaris. And I thank you for the opportunity of sharing something very special to my heart with all of you. Fantastic. So moving forward to introducing Farah, because I think one of the things that happens with a lot of us is when we travel, we wanted to capture that memories. And um, I personally believe in um, hiring a professional photographer to maybe do one day special photo shoot of some sort. But um, so I wanted to take this opportunity and introduce Farah, who is a fantastic photographer, storyteller. And Farah, without any further ado, tell us a little bit about about yourself and share some of the tips on how do we get this perfect picture um, that we're not losing those memories. I think you have to mute one of those. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so hi everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the video. That was amazing. I just wanted to go. Uh, Farah, can you come a little bit closer? Oh, okay. So can I, can I switch between the two phones by any chance? Between Mona and Baba? Okay. Um, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's better, right? Exactly. Okay, perfect. So without further ado, thank you so much um, again for all the trips. And I feel like I am dreaming again to travel. So hopefully we get to travel soon. And um, about me, for those who don't know me, my name is Farah and I'm a photographer and, and a graphic designer. I am actually, um, what I studied is graphic design and photography was a hobby. And with um, moving to Toronto, I went to Ryerson, studied photography just to learn more about technical stuff. And I started getting into it more. So I loved, um, so I started getting hired. And from there, I didn't know what to pick as a niche. And one day, one of my dear friends asked me to, um, to second shoot with her a wedding, a wedding. And I'm like, yeah, sure. So I got a year to practice. Meanwhile, I learned that I love wedding photography. So I picked that as a niche, not because I get to, to shoot like love stories and meet incredible people, but also I get to um, experiment all with all kinds of photography in one day. And that was great. And I love lifestyle and branding. And that's how I actually met Layla, one of the reasons how I met Layla. And, um, and I started teaching last year photography as well with a company called the Photo Academy. And, uh, 
and, uh, and now I'm moving everything I teach with them to another uh, platform called the Pix Mentor. So all my classes are there. And now I want to teach you about this phone where you have with you all the time, which is great. And with a couple tricks that you can uh, use, you can do, um, with a couple tricks you do, you can actually, um, I'm just gonna activate this camera and without my face turning this here. Okay, so if you can see, I don't know, you have to go to Mona Gazelle so you can see that screen that I'm sharing with you. All right. I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Cause I have two phones and Mona Gazelle is the one now it's camera on and I have my face on one of them. Um, I think we'll, Let's see. So Farah is my just Okay, I can see that. I think we all need to pin that video. Yes, we'll pin if you can pin Mona Gazal and then Yeah, so for those of you start. following, just go to Mona um Gazal. And that's my mom's phone because I didn't really do all the back end work. <laughs> Made it easy. Okay. And we're good? Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Okay, so now let's start. So first of all, when you're using your phone, whenever you're taking a picture with your phone, first of all, you better clean the lens from the front, the back, and usually there's a lot of stamp on it, and that will reduce the result of the image. Second, I'll go through the technical stuff, and then we'll talk about composition. And composition is the most important part. So let's start with technical things in your phone that you need to learn before you travel anywhere or taking any picture. So now I want you to, if you have your iPhone, I think there is a live, always the live, um, if the live is on, turn it off because this will actually get to, to you will, it will take a picture before and after you take a picture. And you really don't want that because um, it will, you will end up with, if you're taking a picture of faces, you will end up with silly faces unless you want to take like a, a file with, for your friends with silly faces and call it like my beautiful silly friends faces. You can do that. However, it's great for animals. So you can take that on when you're traveling to Africa because this will capture a couple movement, like a action shot. So, but if you're taking nature uh, and you're far and not so close to the animal, better turn it off. Now, another thing, um, it's the, uh, there is um, an HDR on your phone, all iPhones. If you go to settings and go to scroll all the way to camera, from camera you can find H auto, auto HDR, which is high dynamic range uh, for, like it's a fancy term for that actually export, takes three images and combine them all together. together. And in photography, exposure means um, the amount of life that get through the lens. So what happened when the when you activate that HDR, it means uh, it will expo it will take three pictures as you can see here. Okay. So the first image it will expose for the shadow, so it's overexposed, which is a lot of it's too bright. And then the second picture is less brighter which is it, it, it will expose for the mid-tone and then this th third image it will expose for just uh, for the highlight so you can see the sky and then stitch them all together and take one photo and this photo is basically uh, great so you don't have to overexpose sometimes you know how you put your picture on the phone and it's like too bright so this with hdr it will fix this problem and it's easier for you uh, when you edit your pictures as well. Um, then we'll go to the grid. The grid is also great to activate because this will help you to, uh, with your composition, I will get, I will zoom in. So with the grid is also, you go to settings, go to your scroll down to camera, and then just slide that uh, on, turn it on. And you will see when you put the camera on, you will, you, this you will see those line on the camera but you when you take a picture you won't really see them it's just to give you i will explain more about the grid because this is more for composition and when you take a picture it will help you also uh, frame the picture with within the hor um, horizon so it's like 
one line and you know you're 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 not tilting your uh, camera basically and here's another one so another thing with the phone whenever you're taking a picture there's that square over here this is uh, and there's the sun sign i don't know if you can see it clear um but this is if you slide that sun up this is more light and if you slide it down this is less light so you can control the amount of lights with that coming into the camera and the picture with sliding this up or down and i'm pretty sure a lot of people already know this now um another thing with with your phone uh whenever you're whenever so there is um with there is an option in your camera or when you're focusing on one subject, there is another term in photography called depth of field, which is basically how many subjects in the frame that's in focus. And in this picture, you can see that when there is, um, everything is in focus, basically we call it, like everything is in focus, there is, it was in the depth of field, so all these subjects are in focus. And when there is, when, and you can do less depth of field, let's say, which is, they call it in photography, shallow depth of field, and you're focusing on one subject, which is great also in photography. It's just like a pro, you can do that with your phone, and I'll show you how in a bit. And then, um, so especially when you're, the one thing that I don't want you to do whenever you're taking a picture is never, never, ever zoom in. So don't zoom in with your camera. Always take, I'd rather you moving around your subject or getting closer to where you want to take a picture of than actually zooming in because this is not, you're not going to be able to either to print or to share and it's pixelated. So always just, if you want to take a picture worth sharing, no, don't zoom. And then uh, with the, with when you're so there's also when you're taking picture for one subject for example my hand i get it closer over here so i can literally tap on the camera and focus on my hand only and everything will be uh, in the background and blurry so when everything when you want everything in the background background blurry if you now turn on your camera and then uh, put your hand and fold and keep and tap your camera and keep holding on on the screen and this actually will uh, help you focus on the subject in front of your hand and then even if you and you can lock the focus so once you see the sign of AF AEAF lock that means you're locking the focus on the, su the subject the closest to your camera and if these you are see great that, uh, tips, Farah. I didn't know any of these. Yes, that's awesome. I'm happy to hear. Okay. Great. No wonder my photos look crappy all the time. <laughs> now I know there's so much to know. Like I like even with me, like with my, uh, I'm I'm using actually I use a, a Huawei phone, so they have so much. Like every time I keep exploring, and with iPhone too, they have newer stuff. Yeah. So if you lock the focus and move your phone. It will stay on your hand so this way you can you can compose your image on one thing so you can compose on whatever you want to take picture of and move it and it will stay on your hand and make everything blurry in the background which is awesome okay so now the most so, okay so this is all technical stuff okay where do i have time or we're good uh maybe two i want to talk minutes. about composition <laughs> maybe two it? more minutes maybe two more minutes Two more minutes. If you, okay, so composition, that's what exactly makes the difference between Sarah, an amateur five, five minutes, go for five? it. Five, awesome. Okay, so that's what makes a difference between amateur and, and a professional photographer. And with your phone, you can definitely be a professional photographer if you apply all the right composition. And when, like you can learn, like you can practice each composition once at a time. And I will give you some tips about it. So now there is, um if, if let's say look at this image over here and and you can see that i my eye is very lost i don't know what to look at like i look here i don't know if that's the subject i look here maybe here it's not really perfect and with the other image over here you can tell that it's the trees that's what i want the people to look at and this is where i'm actually letting your eye go to so that's a composition that tells a lot. So now, 
I will talk about perspective. First thing with perspective, it's um, so you there is low angle. So it's, it's with perspective, it needs you to move around. So low angle, high, high, high angle, and then you can move around. And um, there is first person point of view, which is uh, I'll explain. So a low angle is basically putting the the. Uh, for, it's great for building. It's literally going all the way down and taking a subject, which is, and that will give a lot of superior look for the building that you're trying to take a picture for, and it gives it an interesting angle. The most boring angle you can do is hold your phone and look up and take a picture. This is boring. Nobody, like everybody do this, go down, go up, try to move around the subject and it will make a huge difference. Now, a high angle, everything like we, also, like when you look up onto something, you appreciate it. Same thing with photography. You look down on something, like you're look, you're actually, when you're looking on it from up in a way, this will give a lot of uh, depth in the image. So that also gives the people that they, they give dreams and depth and they want to travel to the place that you went to and they want to know more about the trip that you've been um, and same thing, so now with movement, movement is basically either from right, left, center, and then try which angle works best for you, you can pick. Uh, now, uh, point of view, standpoint of view is basically you, you, you take the photographer, yeah, um, you take the viewer in the, uh, so the viewer will be, will see the picture within your eye, the photographer eye, which is putting part of the body in the frame. So for example, and you've seen this a lot on Instagram, like you see people uh, sitting on a very high um, building and then their feet down and, and it feels like, oh my God, if I was there, what would happen? Like, you know, if I want to be there, some people, their adventure is enough to dream like that and somewhat something like that as well. Uh, okay, we're good. There's one more. Uh, I'm just going to ask people to type in their questions while you're showing us the, the last tips. Yeah. Okay. So leading lines. Leading lines, there is uh, two types of leading lines, geometric and organic. When it comes to, to geometric, geometric, it's actually with uh, uh, basically buildings, streets, all that, and you're leading the viewer from outside, outside inward to one thing. And this is a great way, like it leads with, you can use building and then there's one here, same thing, outward, inward. And this is another composition frame inside the frame. It's very interesting. People love to see that type of pictures. Uh, with organic leading line, we can go, it goes like between uh, water, trees, which is great for Africa and Kenya. And, and you can like do so much if you apply leading line uh, on your trip to Africa. And then same thing with water, the reflection is actually, could be leading line is the difference between that reflection here and then the trees. Um, it could be the difference between the colors. So you, you can really, it's like a very powerful tool to play around with. Rule of third, another composition, uh, and it's amazing. And that's where you can play, like you can use the grid line that I told you to turn around, turn on. Uh, and that's, that's it. Like you put your, the, you put the, the subject either on the third, on the right or the left. And this will give the viewer of telling a story and giving, uh, so you put your subject here and it gives foreground, foreground, mid ground, background. If that was in the middle of the frame, then I'm only drawing my viewer to this one point, point place. And then if it's like all of it, I'm actually telling the story. You can see the mountain. So basically you put the, you put um, another subject in the background, but it's not the most important thing. You want the viewer to start here and there and tell the story. And a last one is dead space, which is as it sounds just like not a lot of like one, one it's you put your subject all the way to the back in a way. And then it feels like infinity but it's kind of also not a lot of things in there it's one thing you're focusing on so a lot of that space people you do use it when they want to write stuff in here so it's great if you have any kind of business and you want to write things you put your subject on the right left and right 
and shooting through things is amazing as well. Close the camera to your, uh, here's just a couple shots that I like, action shots. And then this, is, this tells the story a lot, like there's just the arm. And then of course it's a low angle and you can see the giraffe. And if you want to travel to Africa, you get a great lens. There's those lenses, you can purchase them on Amazon. And there's the same so photo. These, these, are, these are the things I'll be sharing with the, uh, with the people who've registered. So um, the, your, the, your courses for her, as, as well as your recommendation in terms of um, okay, great. some of awesome. those we're things. Done. Awesome, we're good. Yeah, I think I'm, uh, I went through all of it. Okay, that, thank you that so was much, excellent. Layla. Thank you so much. Yeah. This, this was fantastic. All right. So we thank have a um, few other questions. Um, so um, so one of them is, because of the luggage restrictions, would you recommend linking this trip with another of a different kind? Um, well, if you can live with 15 kilos of a luggage and for a longer than maybe two, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe more than two weeks, I would say yes. The other thing I forgot to mention is a lot of those lodges and uh, safari camps, they have um, laundry services. So um, you will not be, um, you would not be waiting for, uh, you, you, you can, you know, wear them and get them washed and that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, the other question is, um, sounds like the safari trip would be between 12 to 14 days. Does that include the Zanzibar trip at the end or is it not recommended that the safari could be shorter? You want, to, uh, so, so can I take that? Uh, sure, sure. So, so you, you can really opt in terms of uh, your timing. So you can do an, an, an eight-day safari of Kenya. You could do an eight-day safari of Tanzania. Um, you could do a 12 or 14-day combination of both. So really the timing uh, is, is up to you. And then you would have to add Zanzibar onto that. So typically eight days in one destination, two or three nights in Zanzibar or on the coast to Mombasa. Did I answer the question? And if I, if you don't mind, I add that I um I think there is um so the other option if you have um shorter uh, or limited time frame to explore, um there is an option of doing sort of like um safari um sky um plane between all those different um, game lodges and even um you could do that something for. Um, seven to eight days. Um, Correct. Correct. So that would be an option. It would be a more expensive one, but for sure that is that is an option to explore. Yeah. Yeah. So the plane safari definitely would be shorter, but more expensive again, because you would be spending a lot of time going between those lodges, something between five, six hours, three hours or so. Um. Okay, so there is another question about the best time to see the migration. Um, Philip, I, we, we answered that, but do you want to repeat that again? Sure. So the time when they are really, uh, when people talk about the migration, they often think about that, that time when they are up in the Masai Mara and doing that movement and coming around and going to cross over the river. So you're really looking at about August, September, as far as that is concerned. So. Uh, it's very difficult to put a specific date to it. We also know that climate change had an impact on it in, in, in some uh, uh, years, uh, previous years, but usually August, September would be good. Yeah. Okay, I don't see any other question, but we'll send a follow-up. Um, thank you to everyone and we'll include, so what I've been doing for those virtual travel series uh, for those of you who are following um, you will get a recording of this video plus um, we include some sort of recipe for that region so you will get some sort of East Africa oh. recipe and some have already received as uh, as part of the reminder as well as uh, Farah has developed some interesting programs for us who are not photographer and wanted to do 
better stuff and uh, some of the um, tools and lenses that we could buy for our next trips. So I wanted to thank you, Philip. Thank you, Farah. I enjoyed a lot. I learned again more and more every single day from both thank of you. you. Um, thank you. Thank you. And I think thank you all of you to decide to spend your um, later afternoon with us. I know it's so lovely outside. Finally, the weather is warming up. And again, stay tuned for the next week uh, virtual travel series, which we're going to go to Sicily. So um, that would be a very different trip than, than Africa. But uh, yeah, um, thank you again. Thank you. And it was, it was so much fun. Thank, thank you, you all. Thanks, Leila. Thank that you. was amazing. And Philip, it was great. Yeah. Thank you. Can't wait to book thank my trip. Thank you, everybody. Have a Take good care. Day. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.